play. That's what the Lord's saying. So just come on up and wing it. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, the fact is that I thought that was quite intriguing. Uh, the message that the Lord has me preaching to you tonight is one that I had in my do not preach at First Baptist Church file because I had preached it at camp. And uh, um, that and as I was praying and the Lord said, you need to preach that sermon. I said, I've already preached it to our kids. And God said, they're not going to be there tonight. Or this was a few days ago, but they're not going to be there. And uh, I, I said, well, I guess that's what the Lord will have us. Um, I wrote this as I was sitting one night um, thinking about all the craziness of COVID. And as, I, um, as we we're going through, it was uh, um, in April and everything seemed distraught. And um, I, I saw, uh, I've seen some choice um, signs in people's yards lately. Um, saying nice things about our governor. Has anybody seen those? All right. They're, they're quite interesting. And so going on. But, you know, uh, she was making a lot of decisions and there were a lot of things and wondering what was going to happen with church and happen with everything else. And the Lord had to remind me who he was. And uh, I was reading my Bible and came across this passage and the Lord had me write this. So Mark chapter 4, verse 36 the Bible says, and when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Can you imagine going up and talking to Christ this way? You know, uh, don't you care about us? You know, and they're, at least the way I read this, they're throwing a little bit of attitude as they're speaking to him. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And when I see this verse, I, I don't know if our Lord had any type of ex, you know, attitude at all as he spoke. But I, I think this is almost like an, oh, brother attitude. Come on, can I teach y'all anything? Can't you remember anything here? And then we see in verse 41, and they feared exceedingly. And this is a sad statement. And said one to another, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's pray. Lord. I pray now that you'd give me your wisdom and your guidance. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be looking to you, that we recognize who you are, recognize how our response to who you are is. Guide and direct our steps now. In Jesus' name, amen. We see here in this story that they came to Jesus and uh, because their ship was in trouble, said, carest thou not that we perish in God? took care of it. But as you look at this story, they failed to recognize that they had God in their boat. They failed to recognize that he was there, that it was all in control, that the Savior of the world was riding along with them. And uh, if they were going to perish, they, he was going to perish too. But as we look at this, uh, boats can get scary. Water can get scary. And we see that a great fear came over them. And even the Savior references this, that uh, how is it that you have no faith? Because they were fearful. And they, they got scared. When I was uh, younger, I was, I think, first or second year of marriage. Met my brothers down in the Smoky Mountains. And one of our favorite things to do was to go cliff diving down in the Smoky Mountains. We happened to be going down during spring break, which was in March. It was a beautiful spring day down there. You know, in March there, did you know they have flowers? It's really cool, all right? 72 degrees, it was great. And my brothers <clears throat> said, hey, let's go jump off this cliff over here. And we said, yeah, that's great. But there were a couple things that we failed to recognize. Number one, it was March. All the water, the water was up a couple feet higher and flowing down through the rivers. And that was because the snow up top was melting and rolling down through there. The water, we found out later from a ranger, was about 38 degrees. 
The second problem was, is the water was a few feet higher and they had, um, uh, they didn't allow kayaks or anything to go in the water right then. Nobody could go into it because it was so dangerous because the rapids were so bad because the water was flowing out of the mountains. But you know, we were dumb 20 something year olds and all of us got up there and our wives uh, were up on the top of the mountain watching us and cheering for us and we all jumped and then they didn't see us. We got down below and we down into the water and as soon as our bodies hit that 38 degrees, all our muscles locked up and we couldn't move. Second thing we realized, we grabbed the rocks because we realized if we kept going, it was full of rocks and um, the current would carry us and we'd get chopped up in a hurry. So we said, we got to go back this way and get up here, but we had no muscles to pull us and we did not know what to do. Right about that time, we got scared. I mean, we got really scared. And so finally, one brother took and we'd push him with our feet and he'd go a little bit against the current on, on the rocks and then he'd pull us. And it took us about 15 or 20 minutes. We were lucky that our wives didn't call out the rescue rangers and everybody to come save us because they were pretty scared. But finally, they saw us come up off the mountain and we were okay. But I understand these disciples were in this storm and it was something similar. They, they were gripped in the middle of the ocean ready or the sea ready to die and they got afraid. Often when we face troubling circumstances, we don't think right. And we see here that the disciples were not thinking right as they faced a troubling circumstance. The first thing that I see is they, they struggled with recognizing that God was in their boat because, number one, they did not acknowledge that he was God. They did not acknowledge that he was God. Look with me in verse 38. It says, And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? There was another group of people in the Bible that would call him master. Uh, that was the scribes and the Pharisees because master is teacher. They did not want to recognize him as Lord and Savior. At this point, he was just teacher. We see then again in verse 41, the sad statement. They said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And they did not refer to him as God. They said, what manner of man is this? They did not acknowledge that he was a God. They accepted him as a great teacher. They accepted him as one that did miracles and seeing these things. But they didn't accept him as God. I want to challenge you tonight that one of the reasons that we struggle in times of trouble and that is because he isn't. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And the fact is we often get into trouble and but we don't believe that he is. The reason we get angry, we don't believe that he is. The reason we panic, we don't believe that he is. And how can he be a rewarder of us diligently seeking him? If we're busy seeking ourselves, trying to get ourselves out of trouble. And so many accept the moral code of Christianity. I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to be the uh, try to read my Bible more. I'm try to do better. But is he your God? Do you recognize that he is in control and that he is God and that he can take care of whatever? Did you know that he knows about COVID? He does. Did you know he knows we got a crazy governor? He does. Did you, did you know that he still expects us to keep rolling along, winning souls to Christ, seeing God do something great? But see, we allow fear to grip us. We allow these things and because God's not real. We allow man to grip us in fear rather than recognizing that we have a God that is in control of everything and that he can guide and direct our path. When the storm comes, do you acknowledge that God is there? You know, um, a preacher once said, the more we know of God, the more undeservedly we will trust him. The greater our progress in theology, the simpler and more childlike will be our faith. 
you know, I love to see what a child's faith, faith is like because they just trust that it's going to happen. I love when they say, my God will take care of this. God can do this. God will take care of this. Just get in touch with God and he'll do it. And sometimes when my children were younger, they challenged my faith because they believed way more than I did. You know, the fact is, is we have to recognize that he is and he can take care of it. When I um, was in the Philippines on my first time that I was there, we, we were traveling up into the mountains and our driver, they took a driver slash bodyguard with us. And I noticed uh, that he had several guns on him. I mean, he had guns everywhere, hidden guns, guns outside and uh, taking care of us. And, and I, finally, the uh, uh, missionary said, hey, would you tell these gentlemen your story? His name was B-Boy. And he started crying. And he said, just a minute. He said, I, I got to get this together. And finally, he started out and he said, well... I was a policeman. And he said, the Philippines is, is corrupt. And he said, it's much better now than it used to be. He said, but back in the day, he said, almost every politician and every leader and everybody high in the police force was very corrupt. He said, and unfortunately, I was their assassin. He said, I was paid by government people to kill people. And that's what I did. I, he said, my real living wasn't the police force. I didn't make much money. But he said, I made a lot of money doing that. And then he said, I've killed over 800 people. Can you imagine that? 800. He said, after I killed around 800, he said, one day a girl got caught in my crossfire. And he said, the people who hired me couldn't protect me. And he said, I went to prison. He said, after about three years in prison, they pulled some strings and got me out. He said, I shouldn't have gotten out. I got out. He said, but I didn't want to go back to living that lifestyle. But I couldn't afford to live any other lifestyle. He said, so therefore, my last assassination was going to be my own. I was going to take my own life. He said, my cousin called me up. He was a pastor and invited me to come to church. And he said, I went and sat back in the back of the church. And he said, I heard of this Jesus Christ who could give me forgiveness. He said, I heard of Jesus Christ who could save my soul and wash away all my sins and I could go to heaven. And I got all done and I sat in the back just bawling my eyes out. My cousin came back. And I said, there's no way that I can be forgiven. He said, I told him about what I had done and I told him about the life that I had live, lived. And he said, God already knew that. He said, and as I sat there, I went through the scriptures. He said, and it clicked in my head that Christ died for me. And that Christ loves me. And he said, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And he said, now I go around, instead of hurting people, I tell them about Jesus Christ. And he said, I work to help people. And he said, God's changed my life. He said, the funnest thing for me is when somebody says, God can't forgive me. He said, there's nobody done worse than I am. And I tell him what I did, and God forgave me. And he said, they can get forgiveness too. You know what? He knew God was in his boat. He knew God was real. I watched him as he bawled his eyes out and thought of the amount of forgiveness that he got from his God. And it was amazing. Do we allow God to be that real in our lives? Do we allow God to work in our heart? Do we look at the forgiveness that he's given us and the protection that he has for us there? The second thing we see here is God knows your storm. Second thing the disciples failed to see was that God knew they were in a storm. It was there. We look here in the scripture. They, they went to him and said, uh, they woke him up and said, uh, Master, carest thou not that we perish? You know what? He was there in the ship. They weren't acknowledging that God was in their boat. They felt like he didn't know what was going on. You know, often when we're in life and we're in struggle, we don't think like God's there. 
We often come to places where we feel that He's abandoned us or we feel that He's not taking care of things in the right time frame, in the right way, and how he, we want things to be taken care of. But God knows. God already has the solution figured out. One night a young boy was caught in a fire. And he couldn't go downstairs and so he ran to the roof and he was on the roof and everybody was screaming, jump, jump, we will catch you. He kept yelling back, no, no, I'm afraid. You see, he could not see below the fire. He could not see the people. And he kept yelling, I can't see, I can't see. About that time, the boy's father came running up and said, son, jump. And he said, but daddy... Daddy, I, I can't see you. And the father replied, but I can see you. And that's all that matters. You know, the fact is, is when we're facing troubles, when we're facing trials, God knows. He can see what the problem is. He can see how things can be handled. He knows what needs to be done. Yet our tendency rather than faith tends to be fear. You know, the lack of his answer does not mean that he doesn't know. You know, when he was there sleeping and they felt like Christ didn't care, they felt like he didn't know what was going on. But David says in Psalms 139, he prays to God, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And I will tell you, when I was a young preacher, I actually preached that wrong. I said, you need to ask God to search and really get to know you. And it was Brother Swain, after I got done preaching in chapel, he was always so good about this. He pulls me into his office and opens up the Bible and says, did you read the whole chapter? And I looked at him and I said, yes. He said, well, you didn't listen to it. And the first few verses were, God, you have searched me. You know me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You know everything about me. I was like, oh. He said, he's asking God to show him what he sees there in verse 1, and in, in, at the end of the passage there. And I was like, oh. So the next time I preached it, I preached it right. But, you know, the fact is, is that's what we often think of. Oh, God, God needs to search through me harder. No, God knows what's going on. God knows what's hap happening. He knows your struggles. He knows your battles. And he knows right now what we're going through. The lack of his answer doesn't mean that he doesn't care. He said, carest thou not. We sometimes create a mind frame of self-defeat. You ever create a mind frame that the sky is falling, that it just can't be done, and we're just not going to get through this? Now, mind you, we have God in our boat. If we're saved, Jesus Christ, uh, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. But we get stuck. And we have this defeatist attitude that we're, we're not going to make it. We just can't do it. It's just going to fall to pieces. My daughter, many of you got to come to probably the craziest wedding you've ever been to. We had, uh, my daughter got married in June and we had a drive-in wedding in, in the cars and a drive-through cars reception. But leading up to that was a battle. My daughter has been planning her wedding since I think she was about four years old. I don't understand it, okay? I really don't. But she, she, she kept a notebook and she had all these plans. And, you know, I, I, the years leading up to the wedding, they'd be sitting there and they'd come up and say, Dad, which of these two colors you like better? And I'd be honest with you, I'm looking at them and I'm like, what's different about those two colors? Well, one's a little more sheer than the other. This one's got a little more, more brightness to it. Great, they're great. Well, which one? Uh, the one on the left. Oh, we like the one on the right. Then that's great. But, you know, going through that. But then we hit COVID in March and things changed. My daughter was like, what are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? 
And I will tell you, my daughter's first response was, we have to keep everything the same. And she began fighting for that. She began fighting to make sure that we could still do everything. And I said, you may start needing to think, oh, Dad, you're, you're, you're being a downer. We got till June. And I said, well, I'm just telling you, it looks like this is going to be a waste. As we got into April, things were getting kind of rocky. And we were seeing that it, things were not going to be turning well for having a full wedding and everything. And we would call Pastor Howell, asked him what his thoughts were. And he said, well, he said, I think you're going to need to create three game plans. He said, I think you're going to need to create a game plan. One, to do it like normal, if that happened to be. He said, number two, create an intermediate with what the rules may be. And then number three, he said, you're going to, you might have to do it in another state. So we had a meeting with the Ruples and uh, us and Kalen and Blake and uh, over uh, Skype or Facebook and got, got on and had the meeting. And, you know, it was hard for Kalen to face that things were going to be different. And we were trying to throw out the ideas and create the three game plans. And then the hardest thing was, it was, when are we going to make the decision of what we're going to do? And we decided May 15th. Can you imagine three weeks before a wedding deciding that's when we're going to start planning a wedding? That, but that's what the Lord had led us. And as we looked, it was the best we could do. And the April meeting went okay, but not super. I was uh, watching live stream. Blake was preaching. And my daughter was down there uh, getting introduced to the ch church um, in Oklahoma where they're serving now over live stream. And I was watching her, and they, they were interviewing her on live stream and asking her questions. And this was the beginning of May. And they asked Kayla, and they said, how has COVID affected your, your wedding? And she started laughing. She said, we don't know where the wedding's going to be, what state the wedding's going to be, how we're going to do the wedding yet. But she said, I had to have a realization because she said, I was bitter, I was mad, and I was trying to make things happen. She said, and one night I was crying out to God, and God said, I'm going to give you a great wedding. God said, I know exactly what your wedding's going to be. And she said, I had a come to Jesus moment. That God would take care of the wedding however he wants it to be. God will take care of this and send us in the direction that he wants us to. And she said, have no idea what's going to happen, but it's sure going to be good, and I'm excited what the Lord is going to do. And I'm sitting there watching this with tears coming down my eyes and saying, wow, praise the Lord, she got it. And let me tell you, the entire month of May, and when we decided, I think May 12th or 13th, what to do, and as we went forward with it, she kept that attitude. I watched her see where she lost a bridesmaid due to COVID, and then she lost another one due to COVID, and then she lost her photographer, and then she lost a, her uh, florist, and one by one, they were dropping like flies. And she said, well, let's see what God's going to do now. You know, she recognized that God was in her boat. See, he's there. She just recognized he was there. And often we face trouble, we face trial, we face battles because we're not willing to acknowledge that he's there, he's in the boat, he'll take care of this. God knows there's a storm. George Mueller said, God delights to increase the faith of his children. I say and I say it deliberately. Trials, difficulties, and sometimes defeat are the very food of faith. We should take them out of his hands as evidences of his love and care for us in developing more and more that faith which he is seeking to strengthen in us. See, God wants to build us. God wants to do something special. God wants to do something great in our lives, but we have to acknowledge that he is in the boat. The third thing we see is the disciples chose to follow fear rather than faith. He says in verse 40, why are you so fearful? 
How is it? How is it that ye have no faith? You see, our refusal to make God Lord instead of just a teacher in our life is generally because of fear, not rebellion. I can remember when I was young and uh, dealing with counseling and I had somebody who was, uh, I thought, in bad rebellion. And I walked down to the pastor's office and said, how do I deal with this? Deal with this? And he said, maybe it's not rebellion. He said, it's coming out as rebellion. But he said, maybe it's fear. And immediately thought we thought of the scripture, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but that of power and that of love and of a sound mind. And the fact is, is he was right. And he was able to help that person walk and build and walk in the crucified life because recognizing that fear was controlling them. You know, most of our rebellion happens to be out of self-preservation, which generates self-control instead of Holy Spirit control. Most of our rebellion is out of self-preservation. We're trying to protect ourselves. That generates self-control. We put our hands on the steering wheel and take it out of God's hands. When we need to allow the Holy Spirit to guide and direct our lives. You know, who do you allow to control your life? Who do you allow to take you to the left or to the right? When you face troubles, who's in control? Oswald Chambers said, faith for my deliverance is not faith in God. Faith means whether I am visibly delivered or not, I will stick to my belief that God is love. There are some things only learned in a fiery furnace. Sometimes we get this wrong theory in our mind that if we're facing trials, God hates us. But let me ask you, did God hate those boys in the fiery furnace? No, he did not. He was there so he could be with them in the furnace. And God wants to walk through those battles with us. We just need to have faith. So what's the answer to it all? Christ wanted the disciples to choose faith. He wanted them to take and believe that he was God and have faith that he could work and take care of all the problems. Hudson Taylor went to China. And as he was making the voyage on a sailing vessel, as it neared the Malay P Peninsula, near the island of Sumatra, the missionary heard an uh, urgent knock on a stateroom. And he, he said uh, he went to the door and the captain of the ship was there and said, Mr. Taylor, we have a problem. We have no wind. We're drifting toward an island, and they are heathens, and I believe they are cannibals. Hudson Taylor looked at him and said, What can I do? And the captain said, I understand that you believe in a God. I want you to pray for wind. All right, captain, but first you must set the sails. The captain replied, that's ridiculous. There's not even the slightest of breeze. Besides, the sailors will think I'm crazy. But finally, because of Taylor's insistence, he agreed. 45 minutes later, he returned and found the missionary still on his knees. He told Mr. Taylor, you can stop praying now, said the captain. We've got more wind than we know what to do with. You know, we must recognize that no matter what battle we face, no matter what trial we face, no matter what struggle we go into, that God is there. We need to recognize that He can calm the winds, that He does have the solutions. Tonight, we need to recognize that we have God in our boat. And we need to set the sails. We often fail to set those sails out in faith that God is going to do something great. We often, we sit back and we say, well, we'll just wait. We'll just wait. We'll just wait. Pastor Howell talked about many churches that he's heard about who are just waiting to set. Not, they haven't even set the sails yet. They, they haven't started church yet because they're just sitting back in fear. And I'm going to tell you, as First Baptist Church, we need to set the sails. We're coming into the fall program and we need to have faith that God can do something. 
We've gotten to see a lot of people over the month of August get baptized. We've seen a lot of people join the church. We see God doing a lot of great things. But now, it's time for us to have more faith. It's time for us to step out and set those sails in our personal life. We face a lot of battles. We face bills. We face sickness. We face trials. We face illness. But we need to set the sails and say, God, I'm going to trust that you're in control. We need to recognize that God is there. Get down on our knees and say, God, I'm going to trust you. I love what it says in Psalms 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You know, he's our fortress and our strength. He says, my God, in him will I trust. Tonight, we need to recognize that we have God in our boat He's going to take care of everything we need. Lord, we sure do love you. Often we get confused. Often we get lost. But you don't. I pray that tonight we would recognize that we have you. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, who would say, Pastor Scott, as you spoke tonight, I recognize we're... I'm not trusting God the way I should. He's there, but I put my faith where it should be. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand tonight so we can pray for you? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Who else? I, I've got in my boat, but I'm not trusting him the way I should. Who else? Amen. Amen. Let me ask you this. Is there anybody here tonight who would say, you know what? I don't have God in my boat. I've never trusted in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And if I died today, I don't know for sure that I'd go to heaven. God's not in my boat, but I'd sure like to get him there. I, I'd sure like to go to heaven. Pray for me. Is there anybody like that? Would you raise your hand tonight? All right. Would you stand with me? In just a moment, I'm going to pray. If God is working in your heart, let's set the sails, come down to the altar, and make it right with God. Lord, we need you tonight. Lord, help us to trust in you. The song says, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Lord, thank you that we can trust you. Guide and direct our steps now. Be with this invitation in Jesus' name, amen. Many are coming, how about you? Come down and solidify things with God. Set your sails and bend your knees and say, God, this is what needs to change in my life. God, this is what I need to have faith for. This is where I need to change my thinking. Many are coming. How about you? What do you need to make right with God? What do, how do you need to solidify your faith? Who else? us to trust you. Lord, thank you for the lessons that you teach us day by day. Help us remember that you're with us, God, and direct our steps now. In Jesus' name, amen.